In my background as a Baptist, um, we didn't follow the church calendar. We didn't celebrate um, even Advent. Uh, we didn't celebrate Lent. We didn't celebrate any of the holy days other than, of course, Easter. So for us, it was a little bit unusual to do that kind of thing. I learnt about Advent at home from my family because my family celebrated Advent because they came from Germany. They come from a European background, but not from my particular tradition. So for some of you, this will be a well-known time of the year. And for some of you, this might be a new experience, this being the first week of Lent. For some of you, it might just be the sound that all the Kugan music is finished and Fasnacht is finally over because that all finished on, uh, on uh, Ash Wednesday. So that was all over and done with. By Wednesday morning, they were still going. I'm not quite sure what that was, the final bang at the end before the dawn or something, but they were still going quite loud on Wednesday morning, but I noticed that's all calmed down as well now. So that whole celebration and party is designed to get all of that out of your system so that for the next 40 days, you fast and pray. Um, and in a country that is supposedly Christian, where everybody calls themselves Christian because you're either a Christian or you're a Jew or a Muslim or something, so you have to pick something, it doesn't necessarily mean you believe in God or go to church or anything like that. It might just be because your parents went to church and had you christened, so therefore you're a Christian and that's it. So in a country that does that, they might even know that Lent has started. They might even have some concept of what it was. But for me, it was a completely new experience. But I think sometimes those of my brand of denomination, not necessarily Baptists, but all of those who have kind of thrown all the tra traditions out, have thrown the baby out with the bathwater. It's a rather obscure quote, but it's a, hopefully yeah, the English comes through on that, is that you, they got rid of some of the good things that possibly could have gone along with some of those traditions by just removing all tradition. Tradition in and of itself is not a bad thing. A tradition for no good reason, that's where you have to start to say, well, what's the reason behind why we do what we do? Um, there's a very old story about, uh, and I'm sure I've told this before, but for those of you who haven't heard it, I'll share it again. There's an old story about a girl who was cooking a roast dinner and as she was cooking the roast dinner, she cut the ends off of her roast dinner and then put it in the oven. And her husband said, why do you do this? She said, I don't know, it's what my mother always did, so that's how I do it. So she was in intrigued and went to her mother and said, Mum, why do we cut the ends off her roast? And she said, oh, I don't know, that's what my mother always did, so I just always did it that way. So she went to her grandmother, who was still around, and said, Grandmother, why do you cut the ends of your roasts before you put them in the oven? And she said, my tray wasn't big enough. So something that it became a tradition and was carried on was just purely for practical reasons. It was a practical reason behind why this tradition went on. So I'd like to say that the reason that I include Advent in my celebration cycle now is because of the tradition of my family, but I think it's also valuable to start to prepare ourselves for the Christmas message, that Jesus came as an infant, but in Advent what we're actually celebrating is looking forward to his second coming. So that's what we're doing at Advent. We're not just celebrating the birth of a baby. That's important. But we're looking towards the celebration of the second coming, Jesus coming back again and finally completing this kingdom, which, as we heard this morning's passage, has begun. He says, this kingdom has started now in your presence. Notice that he's not dead yet. The kingdom doesn't begin just with Jesus' death and resurrection. It, becomes, it begins with his declaration that the kingdom has begun. It becomes with Jesus saying when the kingdom begins. So I think it's important that some traditions we do celebrate and we do remember. So we will be doing a series on Lent and we're going to be going through the weeks of Lent and uh, focusing on the future and, and what that means. And in Lent, like at Easter, we look forward to the second coming of Jesus at Christmas time and Advent. In Lent, we look forward to Easter. We look forward to the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. Is death but also his resurrection. You know, I like movies and I like all sorts of movies. Um, and I don't know if you can say you like the passion movie um, because it's really brutal and it's really <coughs> difficult to watch. It's not something you can watch over and over again, but I'm sure you're aware of this movie that was made by Mel Gibson 10 or 12 years ago and it shows the passion of Jesus. And while a lot of that in that movie is great, the thing that I get a bit annoyed with is at the end, they really don't focus much on his resurrection. It's all about his, his beatings and his death, and that's why it's called the Passion, of course, but 
I would really, they've, they've spent just a couple of minutes, five minutes on his resurrection, maybe a scene on the beach with the, uh, the fish and, the, uh, and cooking the fish over a fire or something like that and sent, giving a final message to his disciples perhaps. Something a bit extra would have been nice to just finish that story off because for me, I believe the resurrection is vitally important. Because if Jesus just died, he could be just a man who just died, a good man who said to do good things who just died. Anyone can do that. But for Jesus to have died for our sins, there had to have been a resurrection. He had to have happened. It had to have been a historical fact. So that's what we're doing now as we're celebrating Lent. There's, no, there's 40 normal days and six Sundays. Everybody says it's 40 days of Lent, but you know from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday, there's actually 46 days. And so the six days a day, the six Sundays uh, are not considered a normal day because Sunday is a day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. So it's a day where you don't necessarily have to fast on those days. But traditionally what people do is they fast from um, all of those things that they would consider good things for the, for the year. Sugar, chocolate, alcohol, all those kinds of things. You, you give all of that kind of stuff up for 40 days. And when you crave that, it's not to make you feel bad, mad about yourself and saying, oh, I eat too much chocolate or I eat too much sugar or whatever but it's to help you to remind you that when you crave for that, to remind you what you're doing it for, that Jesus died on the cross for you, that Jesus came and did this for you so that you would have a changed life. So every day of Lent, it gives us an opportunity to remember what Jesus did for us. And I think that's a good thing. That's a tradition that we can be in touch with and join in on. Lent also reminds us of our baptism in Jesus. For those of us who have been baptised, and that's why Lent begins on the first Sunday of Lent with this story of Jesus' baptism. Up until this point, Jesus was about 30 years or so. In 30 years of his life, we only know a little bit about his birth, a little bit about his younger years, about the story about him going back to the, hanging out in the temple and his parents going looking for him. But other than that, for the first 30 years of Jesus' life, we really don't know anything about him. Everything we know about Jesus is crammed into the last three years of his life. But this is where Jesus' ministry kicks off. He goes to be baptised and he goes into the desert to be tempted. They're two important things. Now you have to remember, to a Jewish audience who was hearing this and watching this go on, they would have instantly recognised what Jesus was doing. He is reenacting re the Exodus story. Going through the waters of baptism is like going through the Red Sea and coming out and being rescued from the Egyptians. Going into the desert for 40 days represents the going into the desert for 40 years. Jesus is reenacting, saying, I'm creating a new covenant with you. I'm showing you that this new kingdom is about you all being God's people because God loves you. Not because you did something right, not because you got everything right and were in the right track, so then, therefore, God's love is conditional. God loves you unconditionally. Problem is, we don't all accept that. But I think one of the most important things that we need to remember when we read this story about Jesus' baptism and going through the temptation, this is all a prelude to the beginning of his ministry. And if we want to see ourselves in this story, we then have to ask ourselves, who am I? What am I about? Who is this person who stands before you? Who, when you stand and look in the mirror, you need to look at it and say, who is this person? And not hear the outside influences that come into you when you're looking at the mirror. But look at yourself and say, who am I? How we identify ourselves is important, and it says a lot about who we are. Some of us identify ourselves by where we come from. For example, I'm Australian. So therefore, that's how I identify myself if somebody says, where do you come from? I come from Australia. And that then tells people something about who I am. They can put me into a bit of a box by doing that. Some of us identify ourselves for what we do for a living. I'm a pastor. People then put you in a box again. I always find it interesting at a party when people don't know who I am and I get introduced uh, to people and they say, oh, what do you do for a living? I'm a pastor. Generally, the conversation ends very quickly and then they go find something else to do. <laughs> they're, 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 they're sort of like, oh, that's very lovely. Great. Oh, Jill, Bill. And off they go. So you've got to find creative ways of explaining what you do for a living because they want to put you in a box straight away. Or the response usually is, no, you're not. You don't look like a pastor. How we identify ourselves is pretty important. Some people might even identify themselves through their passions. You might be 
passionate about being a scout leader and that might be something that you're passionate about. And you might say, I'm, I'm Marcus, I'm a scout leader and I love helping kids go through the woods and, and, and uh, go camping and build fires and that kind of stuff and that's how I identify myself. Or I like 10 pin bowling or whatever your passion is. That might be how you identify yourself as. The problem today is often our identity is bound up in what other people think. You look at all of the different things that are called social media on the internet. They're all about getting people to like you. You post a picture and you want people to like your picture. You post pictures of your food to show people what wonderful things you're eating and how healthy you are. You don't show the great big pile of chips that you just ate, you just show the picture of the salad that you just prepared. You know? And you only show one portion of yourself to the people out there too because you don't show everything, warts and all. You don't show all of the images of what you are on the internet. <coughs> But that's what it's all about. It's about recognition, about getting likes, no matter what kind of format that is. Because we're trying to get our worth from other people by them saying they like what, we've, what quote we've quoted, what Bible passage we've put on Facebook, what, what picture we've put, the holiday that we're on. We think that we get that validation from other people that will tell us who we are. But that doesn't tell us who we are. Sometimes we look in the mirror and all we see are words like failure, bankrupt, alcoholic, loser. Those names don't come from God. Those names are not what he calls us. Those names don't even enter his vocabulary. When we see those things in the mirror, that's not our true self. That's not who we are and we need to stop listening to other people for who we are and start finding out where our true value comes from and where our true identity comes from. Some Christians even identify themselves from a denominational group like Baptist or Lutheran or Anglican or whatever and obviously we don't do that here because we're an international church so we come from all sorts of denominational backgrounds. Unfortunately when we see our identity in our failures that leads to a false view of who we are. And if we have a bad view of who we are, we can't be used by God to spread his kingdom. If who you believe you are is a failure, how can you do anything good for God's kingdom? If who you believe you are is what other people tell you you are, how can you do anything good for God's kingdom? How he identifies ourselves shows where we place our self-worth. I'm Marcus Schmidt, I'm the son of Wolfgang Schmidt and Crystal Schmidt, I'm the father of Jacob and Chloe, I'm the husband to Alison Schmidt. There's a famous scene in the movie Gladiator where he describes who he is, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, uh, it's another pretty brutal movie, but you know, he goes into a big monologue about I am the father to the, and he's just explaining why he is here and who he is. And that can identify me in some way, in fact in our last um, hometown, I say last hometown because I don't know what else to call it because we're never moving back there. So at the moment, this is our hometown. Lucerne's our hometown. In our last hometown, when I went to um, the schools to help out with the kids um, at school, my, my kids' schools, um, I would introduce myself and they'd go, ah, you're Jacob's dad. Or, ah, oh, you're Chloe's dad. So I didn't even get called Marcus anymore. I didn't even use my own name. I was just somebody else's father. And I'm sure as they get older and they're teenagers, I'll be more and more just Jacob and Chloe's dad. And that's okay too. And that's where some people get their identity from. Who they relate you to. Who they can link you to. I've got to stay, say, with sharing a little bit of my history, growing up, I grew up in a, a church Christian home. I don't remember anything else other than going to church on a Sunday. I knew no other lifestyle. That's what we did. The first thing we did when we moved to Australia was find a church to go to. And we started attending church. I've got pictures of me in a little suit when I was about two years old, wearing my little suit to church, because they all wore suits back then. You know, they wouldn't do that now, but they do now, they did then. So all I ever remember is going to church and Sunday school and youth group, and I learnt Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, from when I was very young. I knew no different. At no point in my life did I have to say, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Saviour, because I was born accepting Jesus as my Lord and Saviour. I didn't expect anything different. That was really hard for me, because I didn't really have this amazing conversion story. But... I became baptised and that was an important milestone for me. I'm not 
trying to tell you that your baptism is not worthy or anything like that. I'm a Baptist. I got baptised as a teenager. That's just how it works, all right? So let's just leave that bit there. But that was my decision process, was saying, I choose to do this now. I chose to be baptised. I chose to go through with it from that point on in. That was my decision-making process. But I also got to a point in my life where I didn't have much to do with the church because I started chasing a career. I wanted money and lots of it. Who, what young man doesn't? You want to have a nice things? You want to have a nice car? You have to make money. And I was chasing my career and I was chasing as much money as I possibly could. But I got a point in my life where I was working on weekends because in Australia you tend to work weekends if you're working in a retail environment like I did. And I wasn't going to church very much anymore. And my brother became a pastor and he had his own church. And I really didn't have much connection with the church anymore. And I really felt like God saying to me, in all strange ways, God can use all sorts of things to talk to you. He used a Hollywood movie to attract my attention. And he got my attention and said, you need to go back to church. You need to learn what it is to be a Christian. You need to learn what it is from other Christians how to be a Christian. I don't want you to read your Bible. I don't want you to sing songs. I want you to go to church and learn from them what it means to be a Christian, which, of course, means reading your Bible and singing songs. But I want you to learn from other Christians. Other Christians are important because who you relate yourself to helps you to identify who you are. Now, it was a struggle for me for many years because my brother had been a pastor for probably 10 years before I was called to ministry. And when my lifelong pastor tapped me on the shoulder and said, Marcus, I think God's calling you into ministry, I said, no, can't be possible. My brother Thomas, he's the pastor. You know, just like you don't have two electricians in the family, you don't have two pastors in the family. You know, if you're, if you're really smart, and we learnt this in Australia, you have uh, one brother who's an electrician, one who's a plumber, one who's a concreter, um, and then you can build your own house and it costs you next to nothing to build your house, you know. So you don't have two electricians in the family, that's kind of pointless. I said, no, God, this can't be true. Thomas is the pastor of my family. And my brother, I love my brother to death, but he's the exact opposite to me. He's the outgoing extrovert, he loves being up on stage, he loves sharing the gospel. Um, I, you know, there's nothing wrong with that kind of a person, but you think of every televangelist you've ever seen, but, the, you know, the honest ones, and that's like what my brother is like. He's out there and go-getter and he's the kind of guy that everybody wants to be their pastor. And I just said to Malcolm, my pastor, I said, I'm not like that. How can I ever be a pastor? And then I said to him, Malcolm, I'm not like you. I don't even believe all the things you believe. How can I be a pastor? And he said to me, and these are the wise words that will stick with me for a lifetime. He said to me, Marcus, if God calls you to be a pastor, he's calling you to be you. Not me, not your brother, not anyone else. You can't be me, I'm the only one there is. You can't be your brother, he's the only one who is. If God calls you to be you, to be Marcus Schmidt. So the question still remains, who is that? And we all have to ask that question, well then who is Marcus Schmidt? And a lot of going through Bible college is helping you to discover who you are for yourself, understanding yourself so you understand how you tick and how you work and what works for you in ministry so that you know not to do fake things that aren't you so that you can be yourself and do exactly what God's calling you to do. My family is a strong indicator of where I find my worth and where I place my trust and attention. Some people, they find it heartbreaking to place their trust and attention in a family because their families let them down. Other people will let you down. I know that there's people in our congregation who've gone through abuse and terrible situations. So when you talk about family, it's not a positive experience for them. But what I want to do tell you is that there is a Father in heaven who loves you. There is a Father in heaven who is always there for you, who never names you failure or bankrupt <laughs> or loser. Because God doesn't see us that way. He sees us just like he saw Jesus in his baptism. And that passage is forever written in the front of my Bible because my parents gave it to me when I got baptised. He sees us exactly the way he sees Jesus. We are joint heirs with the Son, which means that we're brothers of Jesus and sisters of Jesus, siblings of Jesus. So when God says, you are my dearly loved Son and you bring me great joy, he's saying that to each and every one of us sitting here and outside as well. He's not saying, you loser, get your act together first. He's not saying... You bankrupt, what have you done wrong? 
Does he want us to do those bad things? Of course he doesn't. Does he want us to change our lives for the better? Of course he does. But that's not how he identifies us. You are my loved child. I bring, you bring me great joy. We bring joy to God. How can we bring joy to the holy creator God who gave us everything that we have and then look in the mirror and go, what a loser. We bring joy to God. We need to remember that we have a Father in heaven who is loving, who wants what is best for us, and who will love us no matter how much we fail and no matter how bad we do. Seriously, go through the Bible and see some of the amazing stuff-ups that God's people have done over time. And God still keeps coming back and loves them. He still keeps back, coming back and giving them another chance. Because he loves us. Not just the Israelites, all of us. And that's what Jesus was saying in his baptism and his time in the desert as he came out and said, this kingdom has become. This kingdom has come now. We know it's not fully completed because there's still so many evil things going on in the world like this thing in Florida. So we know it's not completely completed yet, but it has begun. You are my dearly loved child and you bring me great joy. We have to remember that we have a Father in heaven who is loving, who wants the best for us. He is just, and he will love us no matter what. I don't often beg, but please, I beg you, identify yourself in the Father's love for you, not by the lies you've been told by people on social media, by family members, by former employers, by people who don't like you, by people even who like you. Don't identify yourself with any of that because the only identity of value is you are a loved child of God and you bring God great joy. Find your joy and your identity in that and nothing else. Now comes the hard part. So what? So what? That's good. That's, that's a nice thing to say, Marcus. We all feel a little bit warm and rosy, but so what? How do we go on with that? What do we do now? In technical terms in a sermon, this is what's called the application. How do I apply this to my life? It's all well and good finding out facts about the Bible. That's useful in some ways. But how do you do something with this in the coming week? Any tradition that becomes legalistic is not useful. If you do something because you have to, that's not a good reason for doing it. If you do something just out of compulsion or guilt, it's not good enough. Traditionally, the church will ask you to give something up for Lent. Feel free to do that if you want to. I'm not going to tell you what you should and shouldn't do. If that's your practice, go for it. Do it, no problem. I'm actually doing it myself anyway. But I'm not going to make you do it. I'm not asking you to do it. I'm not going to guilt you into that. What I want you to do is I want you to begin something for Lent. I want you to take something on for Lent. This is a little bit harder than giving something up, trust me. There are six Sundays in Lent. And on those six Sundays, I want you to pray and I want you to think about six things that you can do in that week. One for each day for someone else. Think about six people in your life that you can do something for. Now, if you cook breakfast for the family every day anyway, you can't count that, okay? Don't do something you already do. It has to be something different, okay? So maybe if you cook breakfast for your family, one day you might do pancakes because you don't normally do that and say... I just want to show you how much God loves you. But when you do these things, whether it's buying a chocolate for the girl at the checkout at Migro, or whether it's, um, I, I don't know, buying lunch for someone you see on the street who's starving, or whatever, whatever it is the things that you come up with to do, just remember that person is just as much a loved child of God as you are. We pay it forward. We don't need to pay Jesus back for loving us. We don't need to pay God back for loving us. We need to pay it forward. We need to pay it to other people. That's what he wants. That's what makes this kingdom on earth. That's what makes God's kingdom heaven on earth. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we pray when we pray the Lord's Prayer. We're a part of that. We are doing his will on earth as it is in heaven. So let's spend the next 40 days filling this tiny little corner of God's kingdom with good acts. You imagine if there's 100 people here and they bless six people every week. 
for the next seven weeks. Do the math. For 4,000 people are going to be blessed by this congregation. That's got to do some good for the world, doesn't it? And if you get an opportunity to, but without forcing it, say, if someone says, why are you doing this? You do it because you're a loved child of God. Tell them that they're a loved child of God. People hear often enough that they are awful and terrible and are nasty, horrible human beings. They don't need to hear it from anyone else. Certainly not from God's people who he has forgiven us greatly. So we need to forgive others too. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together. We are lucky indeed that we're even able to come and meet together today. We know there are places in the world where this meeting would be illegal. Lord, we thank you that we don't have to hide what we do from the police. We thank you we don't have to hide what we do from anyone. But especially we want to thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son so that we would reconnect with you. Thank you that for those of us here who have reconnected and chosen to be a part of your family. We pray for those who have not made that choice. We pray that they come to a renewed connection with you so that they can feel a part of your family and feel truly loved by you. Holy Spirit, show us the six people that we should bless this week. Show us the six people that we can bring your love to this week. Help us to think about who they might be and to plan ahead so that we don't get to the end of the week and go, oh, I forgot. Holy Spirit, niggle at our minds and remind us that we made this commitment to do this. Help us to be your people in your place, to spread your kingdom far and wide. We pray these things in your name. Amen.